Um, if you were here last week, Pastor Naftali preached to a joint congregation and gave a very appropriate message. Um, and it, I found it rather ironic because I was already preparing this week's message since I went on vacation over the week. Um, and it, it has a very similar theme. So when God does that, I want you to really pay attention to it because it means that that is important. Uh, God doesn't repeat himself frivolously, which means a lot of us are probably either experiencing in our personal life where we're seeing someone that is relatively evil prosper, or we're experiencing where we want God to be just and the justifier, but we're seeing uh, people who are willing to do wrong things advance, whereas those that are seeming to choose to do the right thing, they're not advancing. In fact, they might even be getting in trouble. Uh, I remember not too long ago, fortunately, this is, that I shouldn't say that, years ago now, I, I, as you get older, things tend to just blur together, right? Um, but years ago now, I remember watching in, in an organization, there was a bully. I mean, this, this person would just yell at people in, in, in the office. They, would, they were uh, uh, kind to a select few, but then just very wicked to, uh, to those that were on their dump list. And, uh, and, and I remember some of my friends getting on that list and it was, it was awful. Um, this person was reported to HR and rather than doing something about the problem, which was this bully, um, this person ended up getting promoted. Um, and, and they, they started moving up in the organization and you, you look at that and you go like, what? God, hello, right? We, we, we sang, you know, there's, there's never a battle that God has not won yet. Hello, <laughs> Wicked seem to be doing wicked things and advancing and, and, and just, just having no problem whatsoever. And, and we're waiting for God to be God. We're waiting for him to show up and to do something. That's a difficult situation to be in. It's a struggle to be in. And so I want to encourage you this morning that there is something that we can do about it. In fact, there's something very biblical that we can do about it. And it's something that I don't hear pastors preach on hardly at all. In fact, this kind of approach to evil and wicked is a little bit avoided. So with me, turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 12. Uh, you'll be happy to hear that this is a relatively short sermon. It's only five verses, but you know me, I can always make a short sermon into a long one. I'm kidding. We're, we're gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling the best um, as you turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 12, 20 through 25. I think I just had too much of a summer uh, and going on that vacation and being in all the dust of Idaho um, just sort of made my body go, well, you're stupid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you relax by force for a little while. So um, turn with me to Acts chapter 12, verse 20 through 25. And in this quick pericope, the short story, we're going to see how an evil person where we watched the last time I spoke to you, him do wicked things and him prospering because of it. We're going to see what God does in that situation. God does not let the wicked go unpunished. So Acts chapter 12, we're finishing off the chapter starting in verse 20. Now, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded uh, Balstris, the king's chamberlain, uh, that's someone who's sort of responsible for all of the king's bedrooms and inner chambers and stuff like that, okay? So having gone to him, uh, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon his throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of the Lord increased and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their serving, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Uh, in this passage, I'm going to slightly disagree with the English. It just it doesn't really change the meaning a whole lot. Um, uh, but in trying to do my research and preparation for these messages, I always go back to the original languages in order to make sure that I understand it as best as I possibly can. Um, and I could be wrong, and if I am, then, then may God um, 
put in your mind what is the right interpretation and understanding. Um, that's always my prayer. But uh, there's just one word I think that I would change, and I think I have a good reason as to why. God does judge the wicked. The issue always is it doesn't feel like it's in our timetable, and therefore it doesn't feel soon enough. And that's part of the problem. Um, it reminds me of kind of a silly joke, and I've already told this joke before, but there's a few new people here, so I can tell it again. Uh, there was a man who had a dream that he went up to heaven and he spoke with God. And he said to God, God, how much is a billion dollars to you? And he said, it, it's like a, like a penny. Wow. Like, God, how, how long is a billion years to you? And God said, oh, it's, it's like a second. It's just like, man, just to fathom that, this powerful God. And so he asked God, God, um, can I have a penny? <laughs> and God said, sure, wait a second. That's how we feel when God punishes the wicked. We want it to be now, right? God, do, do something now. I'm hurting now. I want you to move now, right? Um, the, the first word I ever heard, learned in Korean was from my wife, and it's the word bali. What does it mean? Hurry. <laughs> Hurry, bali, bali, God, hurry, hurry, right? Because that's very common. That's, that's, that's how we feel. We, we want something. We want it now, right? But God doesn't work that way. He doesn't work in our timetable. And everything he does, he always does for a reason, which means even when he allows evil to exist, he allows it to exist for a season. And there's something important that he's doing. And he always does it at the right time. So God does judge the wicked, but he'll do so in the perfect way where his purposes will advance. That's what this story is teaching us. And if you miss that, then you miss the whole point of the short pericope in the book of Acts. See, Herod, who is not a moderately tempered man, we saw that in the last passage, right? The whole story was developed of how bad Herod was. He got upset with the church. He grabbed James, killed James. He, he, he loved the reaction of the Jews because many of the people of the church had scattered due to the persecution of Paul. And so he reached over to grab Peter and kill him too. But when an angel released him, Herod didn't calmly realize, oh, maybe God is doing something and I need to pay attention. He took the guards, the four guards that were supposed to be watching Peter, two that Peter was chained to, and the other two that was to guard the door, making sure nobody would go in or out. He took those guards and after questioning them, he just executed them. Not a thoughtful man. A reactionary man, a man driven by emotions, and everybody knew it. So when, in the beginning of this story, he goes up to Capernaum, which is where he normally reigned, he would only be down in Jerusalem for the holidays, right? When he would go back home to where he normally would reign, he got upset with Tyre and Sidon. Now, the Bible doesn't say anything about why he's upset. And in fact, with these types of people, you didn't, you, you didn't have, have to have a reason to be upset. I remember walking into the office of, of, of this bully that I told you about earlier. And, and I never knew if it was just going to be a, a good personal meeting where we were going to have a good conversation and get stuff done. Or I was going to get yelled at for some inane thing that I didn't do exactly right. You, you, you felt like you're constantly walking on eggshells in front of those people. That was the type of person that Herod was. And so the Bible just says, yeah, he got ticked. He got ticked at Tyre and Sidon, and that was a big problem. Well, why? The Bible explains why it was a problem. See, these people, in verse 20, needed food from the king. They did not produce enough food on their own. So they had to go to King Herod, and they had to make him feel good. Right? They had to placate him. They had to sort of stroke his ego a bit in order to make sure that he was willing to send them food because if he got ticked, he could just cut off their food supply. Now they would starve to death and, and you know, they've, they've got to solve that problem. So they decided to go to the king in order to try to 
stroke that ego in order to try to um, calm him down in order to try to hope that he would not go to the nuclear option of just starving him out. So they end up going to the king in a very polite and, and you know, uh, eating crow type of manner in order to get him to not be angry with them. And the king decides to do a kingly thing. He gets all dressed up in his kingly robes, and trust me, Herod loved his kingly attire. He sat down on his throne, meaning he was speaking in the full authority that he had as king of Galilee. And he made a declaration of what he was going to do. He wrote out a speech, and he gave the speech on the throne in order to tell them this is how we solve the problem. Now, we have no idea what was in the speech. We have no idea what the problem was. All we know is that this is what he did in order to say, my will is done. This is our solution. And they respond, not by like breaking up into committee and being like, is this a good thing? I mean, are we, are we like dealing with this? They just knew they needed to accept whatever it was, right? Because Herod, if there was one thing that all of the line of Herod was good at, it was making deals. This is far before, um, you know, Donald Trump's the art of the deal here. But it was that same type of like, you never knew what he was going to do. He was crazy enough that people were freaked out by his tantrums of anger that they were willing to do anything in order to make sure that they didn't feel the full front of, of his anger. That sort of reminded me years ago when, when Trump went over and talked to North Korea and, and then North Korea started to get mad and they were like, you know, well, we have a nuclear button. Donald Trump was like, yeah, but my button's bigger. Right, you just, you don't know what that kind of guy is gonna do. And so they, we didn't hear anything from them. They, they, they freaked out. They're like, let, let, okay, well, calm down. We'll play nice. Tyre and Sign decided not only play nice, they decided to go all in on making him feel good. And so after he delivered his speech, this is how we solve the problem. They start saying this, the voice of a God, not of a man. Now, is Herod a God? Clearly not. Is he a demon? Well, no. Is he possessed by one? Probably not. But he's not a god. He has no special power whatsoever. And they're not saying he is God. See, in the Greek, it's, it's very clear when it's talking about God the Father. Because it always uses the article in front of God. The God. And so we know how to be able to say it's a capital G-O-D. When that is absent... It's either absent for two reasons. It's absent because there's something special that the author wants to do, like in John 1.1. 1, 1. Or in this context, it's saying he's not the God, as in God the Father, but he is a God. Right? Because the, the word for God is just theos. So it's talking about either God the Father, as in ha theos, right? The God. Or it's talking about a minor God, like Zeus would be small g God. He would just be a God. Same word, theos. So they're saying he's a, this guy's speaking like a god. He's, he's the voice of God. He's like Hermes. He's just so eloquent and brilliant. And what should have happened, what Herod should have done, is to say to all those people, no, 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 I'm, I'm no, not, I'm not a god. I don't have any, what, what happened? I command you to put it back on didn't work so he's not a god but he should have said i'm not a god he should have said i don't have special power he should have said i serve the one true god and he's the one that can give me any wisdom to be able to solve this problem he should have given god glory but what did he do yeah 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 yeah, yeah. nothing he didn't even do that no 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 Right? He just clearly was like, yeah, I'm God. And God said, what? God was so angry that God killed him immediately. 
an angel of the Lord was there and he smote um, Herod right away and Herod died a very painful death. And the Bible explicitly says in 12 verse 23, the reason why, because look, he smote him instead to which he did not give glory to God. He smote him because Herod was proud. He smote him because Herod didn't give to the one person who deserved the glory, the proper glory. And people read this passage and go, what? Why? Because, wait a minute, God is killing him because he doesn't give God glory. That's the reason. Think about it. They kind of have a point here, right? God doesn't kill Herod or punish Herod for murder. It's kind of a high, you know, crime here, right? You would think that God would be like after killing James, hey, you can't kill my apostles. Zap, you're dead, right? But he didn't. Even when he went after Peter to try to kill somebody else, God intervenes by saving Peter, but leaves Herod in power to still butcher four other soldiers. So he's not killing him for murder. He's killing him for pride. I mean, let's kind of wrestle here with the text. Which one would you be more upset about? A murderer or someone's like, yeah, I am all that. Who would you want dead? Right? If, if I were to bring in here, Hitler killed 6 million Jews, killed probably a total of 20 million people, and then I brought the braggart from your school. Or maybe the one person at your job that's just like so irritating because they think they're the best at everything. And I said, okay, God has given me the power to kill one person. Who do you want to see die? How many of you would be like, kill the proud guy? Well, let's let Hitler live. No. So we clearly have an issue here with the text. Everybody who reads this says, I, I, I don't get it. Why is God being okay with him killing someone, but not okay when he doesn't get his proper glory? Because we would say, doesn't that make God petty, right? Kill my servants. All right, fine. Don't give me glory. Oh, that's too far. And that's the problem that we see. I see this all the time. Whenever I watch videos from atheists, they look at these types of passages and they condemn God because they say God is petty, God is egotistical, God is a narcissist. He's demanding us to worship him. And if we don't worship him in the right way, he gets mad and delivers horrible judgment against us. But yet all these other problems, people starving, uh, murderers going free. Do you, do you realize folks today in the United States, we say that God punishes the wicked, but here in the United States, we are at an all-time high of unsolved murders this year. In fact, they're estimating that 40% of all murderers never get caught. So if you want to commit murder, now's the... I'm kidding. <laughs> the evil's not getting punished. And what we think is that the, the highest evil murder is just seemingly like, oh, it's all right. But yet God seems overly vengeful when I don't say, oh, praise God. I'm not a God. God is God. And God's like, you didn't say that? Well, now you die. The reason is we don't understand just how bad this issue is. We see it as just an issue of pride. But it's so much worse for all the people involved in this. You have to remember the two cities here, Tyre and Sidon. If you know anything about biblical history or you know anything about the geography, you would know that both Tyre and Sidon are in the north of Galilee. They do not belong to the Jews. They are Gentile cities, which means these are not people that follow God. It is okay for them to make a mistake, it is not okay 
to misrepresent God. What do I mean? Let me explain. The reason why this is so bad is because by the actions of Herod, he is allowing all the people to break commandment number one. What is commandment number one? There is to be no other gods before the presence of God. They are declaring Herod to be a god. That's breaking commandment number one. And he is allowing it to happen in Israel, in Galilee. So he is permissive of them directly defying something that he is supposed to protect and stand for. Problem number two, he is also allowing them to break commandment number two. Commandment number one, no other gods before me. Commandment number two, you will not make unto yourself a graven image. By propping Herod up as a god, he becomes an image that they worship rather than worshiping the one true God. So by doing that, he is allowing them, permitting them to break two of the first commands of the Bible, right? Not commands of the Bible, but, but the, the Ten Commandments, the Diacalogue, the ones that we all know, right? First two that God mentions, he allows them to break. But believe it or not, this is not the main complaint that God has. The main complaint is this fact. It is that he is himself breaking commandment number three. What is commandment number three? Commandment number three, according to Exodus chapter 20, verse seven, is this. You shall not proceed to carry the name of Yahweh, your God, to the vanity. Now, what does that mean? We've often heard it, you don't take the Lord's name in vain, right? And people throughout all of time and history have had a number of interpretations of that, that concept of take. And we in the United States kind of, kind of had for a long, long time the sort of theory about this commandment being don't use God's name in vain. Don't say the name of God and then, but not really mean like you're praying to him or worshiping him. So we got really upset. I remember growing up in churches and, getting, and people getting really upset when anybody ever said something like, oh my God, right? Um. Uh, we, when coming back yesterday, uh, it just makes me laugh that God sets all this stuff up for me, but we coming back yesterday had someone on our plane grab my wife's luggage instead of her own luggage and take off the plane, and we didn't realize it until it, was, it already had happened. So we found the name of the person whose luggage had been left behind. We went down to the, the counter and said, hey, we think they grabbed the wrong luggage. They found her name and number on their ticket list. They called her up and said, hey, we think you took the wrong luggage. Where are you? And her first response was, oh, Dios mío, which is, oh, my God. <laughs> right? Now, the reason why we said that is because that's how Israel treated God's name. It was so, supposed to be so holy that the tetragrammaton, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, was never spoken. They never said it out loud. They always said, whenever they came to that, even in reading the Bible, they always said Adonai, meaning my Lord, not Yahweh, because they didn't want to break this commandment. Why? Because there is something that happens at the end of the commandment that's scary. In, at the end of Exodus 27, it says this, because Yahweh will not intensely acquit the one that proceeds to carry his name in vain. What, wait, God's not going to acquit them. You mean God's going to hold that sin over them for the rest of time? Whoa. So they were scared. That's why they were like, they don't even say the name and, and, and have it in a, in a vain manner because they didn't want that consequence. They wanted to be forgiven of their sin. And for God to say, yeah, I'll, I'll forgive one and two. You screw with three. I am not going to forgive that. Well, why? It's not, does that mean that if I come in and be like, oh God, I had a great vacation. God's like, I'm not forgiving you. No. Because the point of the command is not don't say the name in an empty manner. The point of the command is don't carry that name in an empty manner. What do I mean by that? Let's look at how it works out in the text. They're all saying a voice of a God, right? But Herod bears the name of Yahweh being a Jew. Everybody knows he's a Jew. He's a Jewish king. 
One of the jobs, whenever you were to become a king in Israel, was you had to write out by hand all of the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy. All five books, you had to write them out by hand in order to make sure you knew God's law, you would defend God's law, and you would punish those who violated God's law. They knew he was supposed to have done that. Now, whether or not he did, probably not. But all people kind of knew what he was supposed to do. He was a Jew. All Jews bared the name of God. And yet he acted in such a way that allowed other people to call him a God rather than to honor the God that he is supposed to serve. Which means ultimately what he's doing is making Yahweh's name, the name of the God that protects Israel, mean nothing. It's just like a Zeus or a Hermes or an Aphrodite or a Hercules. The name is totally empty by him. He's not honoring God. He's honoring himself. And he bears God's name. And they all know it, which means they will not look at Herod and ever have a chance of thinking, you know what? Maybe I should follow that guy's God because of how good he is, because of how honorable he is, because of how significant he is. That's what we're supposed to do. We are Christians. We need to bear the name of Christ in everything we do. And when we, bullies, are mean-spirited, are angry, when we act like everybody else who is sinful in this world, and there is no difference between them and us, then we are bearing God's name in vain. And that makes God very angry. God is serious about this, so serious that Herod was punished severely. There's more. Not only is he holding God's name in vain, but this is what that does. When I act in such a way that God doesn't matter to me, but I'm supposed to bear his name, then all the laws of God don't really matter to me. And that's why this man, who supposedly bears God's name, is willing to do something so horrific, like killing Herod, or not killing Herod, that would be suicide, but killing James, or killing Peter, or killing those soldiers. Because life is important to God, and when God is not important to you, what he holds as important is not important to you either. So life doesn't matter. So what we saw in the beginning of the passage was a symptom of the problem with Herod's life. He doesn't hold God's name as worthy of honor, which means all the commands of God are not worthy of honor either. He loves power, he wields power, and he abuses power. And if you get him in his way, he has no problem in eliminating you. That is unfortunately how many people are today. They don't love God, and because they don't love God, they don't care about God's rules. And because they don't care about God's rules, they behave in a certain way that clearly identifies that they don't live a life worthy of God. The worst problem, though, is when we see that in the church. Because when those people go out into the real world bearing God's name as empty, then it gives a bad name to everybody else who bears God's name in, in truth. So God deals harshly with him. He kills him. He strikes him dead. But he doesn't strike him dead by just being like, okay, heart attack. <clears throat> right? No. He allows worms to eat him from the inside out. That's nasty. That was a problem that happened to a missionary. A missionary was 
in one of the islands over near Papua New Guinea, around like Vanuatu and, and, and uh, the New Hebrides Islands. She was, she was living amongst those people. And this missionary, she would, she would tell interesting stories. She said, yeah, I was, I was there with people and they were you know, basically naked. Just, you, know, you could see everything and they had this, this, little, this little string that wrapped around their waist and was tied you know, around their belly button. And she went up to them and she said, like, well, you know, why, why are you wearing this string? And they looked at her and, oh, you don't want us to be naked, do you? <laughs> kind of think they're missing the point. But because they didn't wear a lot of clothes like that, they would sit on these rough logs for chairs. And so their butts were, like, really callous. Like, it was you know, like just scales back there because they were, you know, constantly scraping it on these rough wood. So they had really, really tough butts. And so whenever they would get sick and she would have to administer antibiotics back then, a lot of times you would give it by injecting it into the rear because there's a lot of blood back there, right? You can give it to the rest of the body. But their, their backsides were so callous that when she would try to poke them with the needle and bend the needle, so she'd have to like go get a running start and be like, ah, <laughs> right, just to inject them with antibiotics in order to help them. Well, every year randomly in the society, people would just die. And she didn't have any idea why. It looked like they were having a severe um, uh, uh, disease like malaria. But when they would give them anti-malaria drugs, nothing happened. Well, one day she went and she ate with one of the, the, the village, um, not the chief, but very important man in the village, very rich man in the village, and he gave her this, this pig that was roasted on an open fire. You know how you shove the stick through the pig and you just kind of spin it? It was one of those. And they gave her like a leg of the pig to eat and there was still hair on it. And it still kind of had some blood in it. And she thought it was really nasty, but she couldn't be um, mean to her host. So she ate it anyway. And then she ended up getting the same kind of sickness. And so she had to be taken to an American hospital. And, and it, she was so sick. She was lying in the, in the bottom of a canoe in order to get her to a missionary plane that could get her to like New Zealand and get her back to the United States for treatment, and she almost didn't make it, but the doctor realized when, after examining her, it wasn't something like malaria, it was parasites. It was worms from the uncooked pig that had now moved its way into her body. And the only thing she could do was to allow them to eat their way through a muscle and then die in that muscle. It was very painful, it was very hard, and most people didn't survive. But because she did, she could be able to go back to that island and tell them, your people are dying because you're not cooking your meat well enough. He died from what? Worms. How do you think he got the worms? Probably didn't cook his food well enough. And probably didn't care about the God that he was supposed to follow enough to follow the biblical diet in Leviticus which means he ate pigs, which means he got those parasites, and it means he suffered that very same painful death. It's slow. It takes weeks to die. And you're, you're, you feel awful. It's like you're in hell, but it's on earth. God was serious about the issue that Herod had raised. You don't care about my name. And because you don't, you live in such a way that you murder my people, you steal my glory, and now you're preventing others to be able to come to repentance to me because of you. So I'm taking you out. Publicly, brutally, horribly. And because of that, two things happen. There's a result. The last two verses of the chapter, there's two results. One is this. The word of the Lord grew and multiplied. So because Herod, who was supposed to bear the name of God, but was a despot leader, dies in such a painful way, people began to fear God because they knew God didn't play around. It was a public execution by 
God's divine power. But here's the other thing, and this is where the change comes in. It says Barnabas and Saul returned. Now you read in your Bibles, it's from Jerusalem. But when I read it in the text, it's the word ace. It's into Jerusalem. And I looked for any other reason why it could be translated from. And I couldn't find one in my lexicons. Which means I would say this. Paul and Barnabas returned to Jerusalem. Because now there's no reason for them to stay away. Because the despot leader who could take him out was removed by God. And that permitted them to be able to do the ministry that they wanted to do that we read about at the end of chapter 11. So God opens the door by removing the very person who was the problem to begin with. You might look at what God is doing in your work, in your school, and you see wicked prosper. And think to yourself, God, why don't you do something now? If God were to do something now to alleviate just your pain, it doesn't affect his name and his ministry as much as he wants it to. So he waits. He's patient. Like a master chess player, he allows all the pieces to go so that in one brilliant move, God says, checkmate. And he allows the wicked to be punished Everybody sees what God does and says, yeah, he deserved it. And everyone starts to fear and honor God because of it, rather than just you being alleviated from your immediate suffering. That's what God does, and he does it all the time. His concern is not just to punish wickedness, but by punishing wickedness, God's name is glorified. So then how do we apply it? This is where you start getting into the problem and you get into the deep weeds, right? Because there's a very easy way to apply it, and that's this. Don't be like Herod, right? No. Now, it's not just totally simple because we should be reflective at this time, wondering, am I like Herod? Am I you know, bearing God's name in vain? The problem is, is that Herod is so severe. He's murdering people. He's allowing people to call him God. And you can say to yourself, well, I don't do that. Right? That's true. But do you do stuff where you're living in open sin or, or openly harming other people or being obnoxious to other people in such a way that because people know you're a Christian, you're tarnishing the reputation of God? Let me give you an example and a little bit of a confession. Something happens to me, and my wife can confess to this, but when I get behind the wheel of a car and I realize how dangerous it is on the road, I can get really angry really fast. This is the reason why I don't put any Christian decals on my car. Because <laughs> I don't want people to recognize I'm a believer and be like, oh, those Christians? <laughs> Right, just the other day, or just yesterday, I'm driving home from the airport, and I'm trying to get into the carpool lane, and some guy who doesn't have another person in his car speeds up and almost rams me, flashing his light, saying, don't get in front of me. And I've, like, in my mind, I didn't say it, but in my mind, I'm like, <laughs> right? Just furious at the situation. I didn't say it out loud, you're the only one. What are you doing in a carpool lane? Right now, if I openly had advertised on my car the name of Christ and behaved in such an angry and aggressive manner, could I give reason for people to be able to not want to worship my God? Because all Christians behave that way. See, we need to repent from times where we carry God's name in vain or God could judge us just as harshly. So I would encourage you, don't just think of the big stuff, but think of the little stuff that you might do where you go, oh, that's not a good Christian witness, okay? Now, here's the other way to apply it, and this is the way that I think God is really interested in the most this morning. How do we apply this? This is the hard one. We can pray for God's justice to be done against those who bear his name in vain. There are people, especially when they're in positions like that of Herod, where they are supposed to be Christians, where they're supposed to be leaders of the community. They claim to be Christian or Catholic or all kinds of 
religions that bear the name of God, the God of Abraham, and yet they act in a way that is vile and horrible and awful. We can pray that God is God and bears his justice upon those people that carry his name in vain so that the name of the Lord can grow. We are not doing this just so that like we don't like that person and they did us wrong and God, right? We want them to do that so that every, we want God to do that so that everyone can see God is in charge and he doesn't allow people who bear his name to go unchecked. Now you might say, because you're all very nice people, do you want us to pray for God's justice? Against someone who's doing something wrong, that kind of seems a little mean. And you might react by saying, isn't that, you know, kind of petty? Like sort of this cartoon with Calvin and Hobbes. It's hard to be religious when certain people are never incinerated by bolts of lightning. Right? We want God to be vengeful against mine enemies, O Lord. Where's the fire? Where's the thunder? Where Jonah? He wronged me. Punish him. That's not what we're asking for. But we can and should biblically pray for God's justice to be done. Here is proof. There is a part of the Psalms which is very odd for people to deal with. It's called an imprecatory psalm. There are all types of psalms. There's psalms of praise. There's psalms of joy. There's psalms of thanksgiving. There's psalms of declaring God as being the creator. But there's also these psalms that are kind of in there. So it means they're inspired by God and profitable. And they're psalms of someone who is angry at sin and commanding God. God, do your thing. Let me give you an example. In Psalm 69, 22 through 26. Now, that's the English numeration. In Hebrew, it's verse 23 through 27. And the reason why you have the difference is you'll often see in an introduction from the psalm, like a psalm of David, right? That's actually a verse in the Hebrew. So some of the enumeration gets a little messed up, okay? We just have it as an intro to the psalm. This psalm operates like that. So in the Hebrew, it's 23 through 27. In, in the English, it's 22 through 26. And here is what the psalmist says. He says in verse 23, it is my will that a table proceeds to happen to their face to a bird trap and that their peace to a snare. Now, what is he saying? The concept is before their face is just in their presence, Right? So they're creating a table, which means, you know, how, how many of you have ever set a table? You put down food, you prepared yourself for dinner. That's supposed to be like this peaceful, wonderful event. And, you know, if you're good Christians, you all hold hands and you pray over the food and then you eat, right? That's what we're used to. Here, the psalmist is saying, I want that to turn into a trap where they think like they're setting their table for being peaceful, but all of a sudden the walls close in on them and they realize that they are caught in the very device that they had set up for their benefit. He says, I want their peace to be a snare. A snare is something that like a hook or, or, a, uh, or a trap in which when it's sprung, it grabs you by, by either jaws clamping it around you or something impaling you so that you can't move, you can't flee. He wants their peace. They're thinking that they did everything right and everything is cool, right? Want, they want that to be a snare, where it lulls them into a belief that all is well in the world and then the trap is sprung and they can't move. Now, that's their desire, right? He says constantly, it's my will that. That's what's called a adjustive tense. But then he does this. It's my will that their eyes will see to darken. When you say your eyes darken, it means I hope they go blind, right? That's what he's saying. But then he says, you must proceed to shake their loins continually. And that's the point. God, you, all this stuff I want, I, I hope that they're trapped. 
I hope that they think that they're peace. They fall. They realize they're falling into a pit. I hope they get caught on their own devices and they're blind to what you're doing. But even if you don't give me all of that, God, this is what you must do. You must get them to quake in their boots. You must get them to be really, really afraid. Afraid of what you are going to do because you are a powerful God. And then he says, it's my will, again, or sorry, he gives the command again, you've got to proceed to pour over their indignation. Think of those two verses back to back together, commanding God. You would think, I can't command God to do something like that. Yes, you can, because you're saying, God be God. God, when those are people who are evil and doing wicked things, you do what you're supposed to do with them. Make them afraid of you. Make them quiver before you. Make them understand how angry they make you. Because that's when they understand that they have truly sinned. Right? If they think they're getting away with it, why should they ever repent? They're getting away with it. But when they truly fear what God could do to them, that gives them pause and reason to change. And again, he ends with, it's my will, it's my will. The burning of your nostrils overtakes them. That means, I hope, God, that your anger overtakes them and that they really, really understand what they have done. This is the psalmist praying to God for that. If the psalmist does it, shouldn't we also? My argument is that we should be praying against those who say that they are believers and do wicked bearing the name of Christ, we should pray that God's justice is done so that people can be able to say things like, oh, that's not a Christian. Or they can be able to say things like, wow, God is serious when you screw up bearing his name. So church, yes, Think introspectively and ask yourself, am I bearing God's name in vain at times? Repent, but also begin to pray for leadership, especially in the United States, because the whole world sees us as a Christian nation and pray against the sin that is in that office, of president or senator or house of representatives or governors and pray that God's justice is done so that the world can see our God doesn't play around. And he demands that we truly worship him in wisdom and in truth, or he will have to do things, force it. So how does God address the sin of bearing God's name in vain? He addresses it with a wicked, and harsh punishment so that Doors of ministry can open. His name can be increased with throughout the world. Which means, church, may God's justice be done. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that your wisdom, your truth, your goodness is shown throughout all the world by us seeing your will be done. We have in our world people who are like Herod, people who say that they bear the name of God, but when you look at their actions, they are so far from you. They do not believe your truth. They do not follow your ways. And as a result, they bear your name empty, in vain. Lord, I pray your justice is done. I pray that your truth is visible and that the world can see you are God and that those who claim your name but do wicked on behalf of your name will experience a visible and open justice so that more and more can come to the truth of you. God, be God. Be God for the people to see so that the world can know we follow the only God that exists, the God who loves them and wants to have a relationship with them. We want your name to be glorified, O oh Lord. And in that precious name we pray.
the name of Jesus Christ.